Hi everyone and welcome again to Book Insights from Memode. I'm Tom Butler Bowden. Each week we do a deep dive into a non-fiction bestseller. It could be self-help or psychology or business or philosophy. It might be a recent hit or an ancient classic. Each book we cover can improve your life or your work in some way or just make you think. Today's book insight is a long-term favorite of mine. Flow by Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi was published in 1990, but I feel it's become, if anything, more relevant today. When the book was written, people had plenty of distractions in the mainstream media like TV and newspapers, but they didn't have the constant interruptions from their smartphones like we do now. Back then, it seemed easy to get into a state of psychological flow. That is, when you get so deeply immersed into an activity, the time seems to stand still. It's hard to do that if your phone is pinging you every couple of minutes. You will learn more in the book Insight about what flow is and how Csikszentmihalyi's research came about. But suffice it to say that being in a state of flow makes us feel good. After a flow experience, we feel more together than we did before because we've engaged in a meaningful activity. We've transcended the usual chaos of our minds. When you're in a state of flow, you're truly in the now. It's hard to be worried about the future or regretting the past. In a state of flow, you feel you're engaged in a creative unfolding of something larger. Athletes call it being in the zone. Artists and musicians might call it rapture. Society, too, is better off if we have a more flow-centered culture, I think. If most people are fortunate enough to do work where they lose track of time, it means they probably have a vocation or a career as opposed to just a job, and that'll make them happier. And the more happier people are, the better communities we'll have. The idea of flow has been a big influence on people like Cal Newport, whose idea of deep work is really a modern update of what Csikszentmihalyi was talking about. When you're doing undistracted, deep work, you're by definition in a state of flow, and the results will be dramatically better than if your head was full of distractions. Anyway, I hope you'll find Flow as fascinating and powerful as I did when I first read it. Please do support the podcast by liking, subscribing or sharing today's episode or just post a comment. We'd love to know what you think. And by the way, you don't have to wait each week for the new book insight to be released. You can have constant unlimited access to over 100 book insights at memo.com slash insights. You'll see the link in the podcast description. Okay, let's delve into the book. Why is it so hard for humans to be happy? Despite being wealthier, healthier, and enjoying far more opportunities than our ancestors, it seems that we're increasingly unable to find joy. In 2017, the U.S.'s National Institute of Mental Health estimated that about one in five Americans experienced mental illness in a given year. If we take that to encompass generalized depression, anxiety, and stress, the search for happiness appears more elusive than ever. Many of us are asking ourselves, is this all there is? According to Mihai Csikszentmihalyi and his seminal book, Flow, The Psychology of Optimal Experience, the good news is that we can, with effort, create meaning for ourselves. And in finding meaning, we can be truly happy. Think of those people you know who seem content with their lot. Open-minded and curious, they rarely complain of boredom. Confident that they can deal with whatever life throws at them, they appear to find delight in the everyday and in their work. Flo tells us that it is possible to become one of these people. Psychologist Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, born in Hungary in 1934, has devoted his life to the study of happiness. In the mid-1970s, based at the University of Chicago, he began gathering data using the experience sampling method. He asked 100,000 participants from all walks of life, all around the world, to write down in detail their thoughts, feelings, and experiences at different points in the day. From this, he was able to identify the conditions under which people feel most fulfilled. It became the basis of his theory of optimal experiences, or flow, which laid a foundation for the field of positive psychology. The subsequent book based on this research, Flow, became a worldwide bestseller. It's been highly influential, both in terms of academic psychology as well as in the wider personal development movement. Now in his 80s, 
Csikszentmihalyi is a distinguished professor of psychology at Claremont Graduate University in California, where he co-directs the Quality of Life Research Center. In this book insight, we'll dig deeper into the book's main themes. They are, first, flow is control of our own minds. Second, flow is about order and complexity. Third, the difference between enjoyment and pleasure. And fourth, it's the experience that counts, not the end result. We'll finish with a recap and a final assessment of the book. As much as we like to try and convince ourselves otherwise, the universe is not designed to make us happy. Life is full of risk, be it natural or engineered, from disease to meteorites, terrorist attacks to environmental crises. Most of us spend a lot of mental energy avoiding existential dread. We've developed all sorts of sophisticated methods to distract ourselves. But these are just that, distractions, from endlessly scrolling through social media feeds to binge-watching reality TV, or hitting the bar with a drinking buddy, we fend off our own internal chaos, a state which Csikszentmihalyi calls psychic entropy. We might be able to ignore the bad feelings temporarily, but we end up as anxious, worried, or bored as we ever were, unable to move forward. To truly find peace and to experience true happiness, we need to be able to control our consciousness, to choose how to respond to our own feelings, instincts, and thoughts. If the universe can't be counted on to make and keep us happy, then it has to be up to us. Momentarily ignoring the demands and expectations of family, friends, and the wider culture, we need to consider what it is that really matters to us. What is it exactly that brings us the most satisfaction and the best experiences in our lives? What do we repeatedly give our full attention to? When we can turn away from boredom or despair and focus on controlling our mental energy, we experience a sense of harmony and balance. Whatever we're doing in the moment seems like the right thing. It fills us with a satisfying sense of meaning. The hallmark of an optimal or flow experience is that it makes time stand still. We start a session of writing, painting, cooking, building, or we start an ascent up a mountain, and we're so engrossed that suddenly an hour or two has gone by. We stop thinking and just do. When we come out of the session, we feel good. The activity is drawn on all our abilities, and some extra dimension of order has been created in our minds. We've had a highly meaningful experience. When we're in a state of flow, we're not racked by worries about what might go wrong or with terrors about the future. We're in control of our own experience in this moment. If you're in a state of flow, you feel you're engaged in the creative unfolding of something larger. Athletes call it being in the zone. An artist might describe it as rapture. But why do we seek out flow experiences? What do they do for us? Let's take a break in our book Insight on Flow by Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. We'll continue next time by exploring flow, order, and complexity. Then we'll look at the difference between pleasure and enjoyment. Enjoying this episode of Book Insights? If so, keep listening and learning. There's a collection of over 100 titles you can read or listen to now at memodeapp.com slash insights. That's M-E-M-O-D-A-P-P dot com slash insights. We're continuing our look into the best-selling psychology book, Flow. It's published by Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. Here is Csikszentmihalyi in his TED Talk discussing the feedback when you're in flow. This focus that once it becomes intense leads to a sense of ecstasy, a sense of clarity. You know exactly what you want to do from one moment to the other. You get immediate feedback. You know that what you need to do is possible to do even though difficult. Last time we looked at controlling our minds. Now we'll look at flow, order and complexity, and then define the difference between enjoyment and pleasure. The ability to control our inner experience has a very clear benefit. Csikszentmihalyi refers to it as ordering consciousness. Living in a highly developed society has obvious advantages. Most of our basic needs are met. But at the same time, we're swamped with many choices. 
Too many possibilities, too much stimuli, and too much striving are first world problems indeed. And in the confusion that emerges from all this, we become blocked by self-doubt, self-consciousness, and self-obsession. We may find ourselves with everything except clear meaning in life. Though at times we feel out of control, it's always within us to restore harmony and build psychological order. Think for a second of animals and young children. They're by no means happy at every given moment, but without the distractions and default chaos of a fully developed adult mind, they can fully revel in each moment. When you're fully engaged, connecting to something outside yourself, doubt, narcissism, and confusion can't exist. They take too much mental energy. We're not necessarily talking about huge undertakings here. Tending a house plant, sketching the view from a cafe table, carving a piece of wood. If these are the activities you choose to focus on and devote yourself to entirely, they will help restore order to your mind. Flow experiences bring order and build a self of increasing complexity and sophistication. Every time order is restored in our mind, we feel more harmonious and also expand our minds. While we may talk of losing ourselves when we're immersed in flow, in fact, it's quite the reverse. The flow process allows us to find ourselves and for that self to grow. Flow experiences lead us to build mental skills and agility, which make us more unique. This ability to command increasing complexity makes us more valuable, steering us to work in harmony with others, integrating with something bigger than our individual selves. In short, the result of flow experiences is that after each instance, a person has become more than they were before. Each piece of knowledge absorbed, each new refinement of a skill, enlarges the self and makes it more highly ordered. This forms what Csikszentmihalyi calls an increasingly extraordinary individual. Opportunities to create flow can be addictive. Life without them feels static, boring, and meaningless. The question of the meaning of life may not be answered in its most esoteric sense, as in why does anything exist? but it can be answered at a subjective, personal level. The meaning of life is whatever is meaningful to me. The experience of flow does not need explanation for those who enjoy it. You're simply aware that it gives you the two things vital to happiness, a sense of purpose and self-knowledge. Flow is about happiness, but to fully understand the concept, we need to look at what we mean by that term. We tend to think of pleasure, enjoyment, and happiness as the same things, but Csikszentmihalyi makes clear and important distinctions between them. Some of our most basic pleasures, food, sex, sleep, are hardwired within us for sheer survival. Enjoyment, on the other hand, is a more active, dynamic process. We refer to some things as giving us pleasure, but we actively enjoy others. Pleasures can keep us alive, and certainly they can distract us from mental entropy. But the active process of enjoyment involves more. In enjoyment, we experience an expansion and deepening of the self. There are things that give us pleasure, such as fine food, good wine, and sunny vacations. But if we think of happiness in terms of optimal experiences, they don't actually make us happy. Optimal experiences involve a process of enjoyment that entails some form of focus, effort, and accomplishment. The process results in growth and increasing complexity. Csikszentmihalyi's experience sampling method definitively showed that the majority of people reported their most optimal experiences were when they faced some sort of challenge and were using their skills. He pinpoints a number of commonalities to this kind of experience. First, whatever we embark upon, we must identify it for ourselves and choose it freely. For example, we decide to follow a new recipe in order to prepare a fine meal. The goal is to make it according to the recipe, so there's some discipline involved and something to measure the outcome by. Second, the task needs to be within our abilities. In the case of the meal, we can read a recipe. We have the ingredients, the utensils, the time. The instructions aren't so complicated that we're setting ourselves up to fail, but not so easy that we're going to get bored. At its best, it should taste good, but that's less important than the experience of preparing it. Third, we must be able to give the task our full attention and to ignore distractions. Busy measuring out ingredients, we forget nagging worries about an annoying boss or the leaking roof. We lose sense of time. We're so focused that we forget about the TV show we usually watch and miss it entirely. Where did the hours go? Fourth, feedback on the task is immediate and clear. 
We followed the recipe, and it tastes great. But there are a couple of things we'll alter next time we make it. Even the most pedestrian task can have purpose. By giving it our full attention, we can even render it enjoyable. The ability to choose for ourselves is crucial to flow. Consider the recent rise in entrepreneurship and the increasing number of workers who have decided to go freelance. This undoubtedly relates to the times we live in, the gig economy and the demise of the job-for-life culture. But this also speaks to people's emerging awareness that creating their own career goals and controlling their day-to-day work experience offers the potential of bringing more enjoyment and meaning into their work life. As Sigmund Freud had it, the meaning of life is to be found in love and work. On the face of it, it may seem strange that we humans set ourselves difficult tasks and goals, but a life of mere pleasure quickly becomes meaningless. By combining challenge and enjoyment, flow experiences are, in fact, quintessentially human. Let's break one final time. When we return, we'll wrap up our book insight on flow by Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. We'll look at why the end result doesn't matter, but the experience does. Then we'll end by discussing the book's impact. Enjoying this episode of Book Insights? If so, keep listening and learning. There's a collection of over 100 titles you can read or listen to now at memodapp.com slash insights. That's M-E-M-O-D-A-P-P dot com slash insights. We're ending our look into Mihai Csikszentmihalyi's best-selling psychology book. It's called Flow, The Psychology of Optimal Experience. Here's Csikszentmihalyi in his TED Talk discussing the euphoric effects. And sense of time disappears, you forget yourself, you feel part of something larger. And once those conditions are present, what you're doing becomes worth doing for its own sake. We'll discover why the experience counts and not the end result. Then we'll end by reviewing the book's merits and criticisms. This talk of focus, effort, and goals may seem to contradict the idea of flow as a smooth gliding experience, unhindered by strain. But although goals are a part of every flow experience, at the same time, it's not really a goal-oriented process. Let's explore this further. Imagine a woman who joins a ballet class. Her working towards dance exams may achieve many pleasurable outcomes, including recognition, vindication, even triumph. Yet her goal-oriented approach makes her less likely to experience flow than her friend, who's learning to dance for the sheer joy of moving her limbs in new and pleasurable ways. Meanwhile, another dancer who's supremely talented and highly successful may well perform beautifully, while at the same time feeling bored, competitive, and pressured. These feelings are not part of a genuine flow experience, in which the ultimate goal is to fully live the experience. The second dancer, who focuses on her own goal, relishing it for the sake of the activity rather than anything else, can truly enjoy it. In doing so, she's building practical skills, deepening her powers of focus, learning more about herself, opening her mind, and strengthening her psyche. These are some of the hallmarks of flow. Flow activities need to be approached with curiosity and excitement. The drive is not to succeed or to show off. In fact, the aim is not to show the outside world anything at all. We just want to engage consciousness fully and relish the experience. In a world where competition, achievement, and success are more highly valued than living well, it's liberating to know you can pursue activities for their own sake, knowing how they order your mind and bring enjoyment. Some 2,500 years ago, the Chinese scholar and sage Shuang Zi defined the philosophy of Tao in terms that mirror closely the flow concept. He said life should be lived without concern for external rewards, spontaneously, with total commitment. Applying yourself to washing the dishes, savoring the experience of making each dirty plate clean, can be as much a flow activity as devoting yourself to writing a symphony. Or think about the coloring craze that recently took the world by storm. This simple activity that takes us back to the full and intense involvement of childhood has no significant end result. Yet in the way it requires total immersion and blocks out distractions, coloring is an archetypal flow activity. As the philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche put it, 
Maturity is the rediscovery of the seriousness we had as a child at play. There are some similarities between flow and meditation or mindfulness. Attention and focus are integral to both. But flow offers the potential to actively strengthen the self. Csikszentmihalyi admits there are parallels with schools of Eastern spiritual thought in terms of the potential to control consciousness. However, in flow, the point is not to transcend the self, but to build its resilience, power, and complexity. Left to its own devices, the human brain tends towards chaos and confusion. Complexity, in contrast, builds resilience and self-confidence that allows us to find a path to our own particular form of happiness. The more flow experiences you have, the more positive impact you can have. The growth and complexity brings awareness of your uniqueness along with renewed understanding of how you fit into your world and your relationship with other people. Flow reconnects you to the world, makes you more unique, and so more valuable to others. Csikszentmihalyi even suggests that the most successful nations and societies of the 21st century will be those that make sure people have the most opportunities to engage in flow-inducing activity. If more of the population is doing what they love, time would cease to be framed by the work patterns of an industrial culture, with its sharp divisions between work and leisure. Instead, time would be determined by individuals' subjective attitude to the activity they're engaged in, that is, whether the activity is flow-inducing or not. A quick recap of what we've learned. We first looked at what flow is and how it is a way of controlling our own minds and experiences. This wards off the natural chaos and entropy of life. We learned of the actual benefits of flow experiences, which include a sense of order, an increasingly sophisticated and complex mind, and a more resilient self that's able to have a bigger impact in the world. We then looked at Csikszentmihalyi's distinction between enjoyment and pleasure. Enjoyment is an active process that often gets us to seek out challenges. A life of mere pleasure would be meaningless. Finally, we delved into the intrinsic benefits of flow experience, that is, doing things for themselves, aside from the success or recognition they can bring. These essentially meaningful activities become an enduring source of happiness. The quest for happiness has preoccupied us since the dawn of time, It's been the impetus for the world's major philosophies, spiritual teachings, and therapeutic theories. The right to the pursuit of happiness is even enshrined in the U.S. Constitution. But the book makes it clear that this inalienable right has never been easy. This is not a 12-step program on how to get happy. Instead, flow is more of a treatise on how to reframe your experience with the goal of achieving a fulfilling life. In this scattershot era of social media, small screens, and endless scrolling, it offers the chance to live a deeper and ultimately happier existence. To feel in control where we once felt distracted, to clarify our choices where we once felt overwhelmed, these are valuable gifts. The book equips us to think about where we can and should search for bliss. It offers a framework for finding meaning in a seemingly chaotic and random world. Nietzsche believed that a will to power was the root of human action, but the flow theory suggests that it is a will to order that really drives us. As the possibilities for how we can live our lives have dramatically opened out, a need has arisen which takes us the other direction, to create focus, order, and discipline in how we approach life and what we choose to do in it. In identifying the real sources of meaning and happiness, not simply the obvious ones, flow has contributed greatly to psychology and personal development. This is the beautiful paradox of flow experience. By losing ourselves in things of deep interest to us, we gain a greater self. Thank you for listening to Book Insights. Check out the rest of our content at memodap.com. Please keep in mind that the information provided in or through our Book Insights episodes is for educational and informational purposes only. It's not intended to be a substitute for advice given by qualified professionals and should not be relied upon to disregard or delay seeking professional advice. Thank you.